Section one, core concepts. Whoa, whoa, section one. This is now codified. We have all of our rules in the rule book neatly numbered and organized so we can all reference them easily. Also, you can totally level up your um actually game. So definitely uh, memorize the rule book and annoy your friends. 1.3.3 unit coherency. This is a big one that has changed in this edition. Five or fewer models. It's the same as old coherency. Each model must be within one inch of another model from that unit. If there are six or more models in the unit, now to be coherent, you need to be within an inch of two other models from that unit. Definitely a big change. 1.4.1, your army can only contain one endless spell per wizard in your army list and one invocation per priest. 1.6.4. One roll cannot trigger two effects. So if you have, for instance, two different effects that trigger on a six to hit, say one will trigger an additional hit and one will do a mortal wound, you don't get both of those anymore. You only get one and you get to choose. Section two, the battlefield. So this isn't clearly defined in the, the core book, but in the General's Handbook, it does give us the specific dimensions for the battlefield. A 2,000 point game is played on a 60 by 44 inch table. That is the same as the 40K table now. So we have unified game table sizes across systems. Section three, deployment. Uh, ironically, this is about what doesn't get deployed. At the end of the fourth battle round, all units that are still in reserve are destroyed. So nothing else gets to hang out forever. Uh, everything just gets destroyed if it's not deployed. Battle rounds. At the start of each battle round, the player going first gets one command point, and the player going second gets two command points. Already significantly different from the prior edition. Number five, the turn sequence. Nothing new here. We're just going to plow ahead. Command points. If your general is on the battlefield, you receive one command point at the start of the battle round. Then 6.1, this is defining who can issue commands and who can be the target of them. A unit champion can issue commands to its own unit. Any old hero can issue a command to a unit holding within 12 inches. Generals and totems can issue commands to units holding within 18 inches. So three cheers for the totem keyword actually meaning something now. A model cannot issue more than one command per phase, and a unit cannot receive more than one command per phase. Now, there is a clarification in the FAQ that abilities that uh, affect a radius around the hero, that counts as targeting the hero itself, not the units that are affected outside of that hero. And finally, the same command ability cannot be used more than once per phase. So if you have multiple copies of the same hero that have the same command ability, they cannot all use their command ability. Only one of them gets to do that. Section seven, the hero phase. At the start of each hero phase, each player may pick one hero to perform a heroic action. What are those heroic actions? I'm glad you asked. On a four up, you can receive a command point. Uh, if a hero is not a wizard, they can attempt to unbind or dispel one endless spell in that turn. It can be their finest hour, and once per game per hero, they get plus one to wound and save until the end of turn. My slide is incorrect. It is not to hit, it is to wound. And our heroic recovery, you roll 2d6. If your roll is under the selected hero's bravery characteristic, they heal d3. Now, just a note on getting the extra command point on a four plus, that only applies to the hero that is performing the heroic action. They have to use that extra command point that you get. And we get a new generic command ability called Rally. 
Roll one die per slain model in a unit and return a slain model to that unit for every six that you roll. Pretty darn good. You can bring back a decent chunk of a horde or swing for the fences and try and get a bunch of Erengard back. The movement phase. Runs are no longer part of a normal move. They are a separate rule. And when a unit retreats, it cannot also run. That is a significant difference. Uh, running and retreating has always been a big thing, and now if you have, say, a unit that moves four inches, they're not getting very far away from the enemy that they were just in combat with. We get a new generic command ability uh, change here at the double. Now it has to be used before you roll to run. You cannot react to a run roll that you don't like by spending a command point and turning it into a six. It has to be turned into a six before you do anything else. And we've got a new generic command ability called redeploy. You use this in the enemy movement phase, at the end of the enemy movement phase, if an enemy unit is within nine inches, but not within three inches of a unit, it may move d6 inches. So that gives you the opportunity to run away, make the charge a little bit more difficult for your opponent, or if you're playing Iron Jaws, move it closer and get the wah on. Section nine, movement. Uh, a change here to how flying units work. If a flying model is on top of a piece of terrain and moves to the tabletop, you measure that distance diagonally. So if, the if there's a change in elevation between the starting point and the ending point, you have to measure the distance traveled diagonally along that angle. Section 10, the shooting phase. Uh, nothing new, just move along. The charge phase, we get a new generic command ability, unleash hell if an enemy unit ended a charge move within nine inches of the selected unit. The unit may make a shooting attack at minus one to hit. Note this is not uh, that unit charging has to end within three inches of the unit shooting. You can have a unit of shooters behind a melee unit and unleash hell well when the melee unit gets charged. The combat phase. Pile in has changed. It is simplified and streamlined. You are no longer moving towards the nearest enemy model. You are moving towards the nearest enemy unit. However, this still stays somewhat restricted because of the new coherency rules. If both players have units that have strike first or strike last abilities, players alternate activations with those units starting with the active player. So if I have a unit that strikes first, you have a unit that strikes first, the player whose turn it is strikes first with that unit and then their opponent goes um, in an alternating fashion until all of those strike first abilities are satisfied and then you move on to the next set of units and we have codified sub phases for the combat phase now you start with your start of combat phase abilities then your strikes first effects then you have your regular combat strikes last effects and then end of combat phase abilities Section 13, attacking. So we have some changes here in the attack sequence. Modifiers to hit and wound rolls cannot be greater than plus or minus one to hit or wound. That does not mean, however, that you cannot have more than one ability giving you plus one to hit, plus one to wound, etc. It means that your net after all of your pluses and minuses can't be more than one saves you can't stack more than plus one however negatives are not limited so your rend three is still rend three and any additional buffs to saves that you have say you are plus two to save against a, an attack without rend you would be plus one to save but if there was rend in the attack 
the additional plus one to save would negate the first point of rend. And we got another new generic command ability. It could be used in the shooting or combat phases. I don't know why it was waiting all till now. Uh, two of them, actually. All out attack, you get plus one to hit. That is for shooting and for melee. And all out defense, that is plus one to save. Also, that can be in the shooting phase or the combat phase. Section 14, wounds. When you return slain models to a unit, the models have to be set up within one inch of a model that was not returned earlier in the phase and cannot be placed within three inches of an enemy unit unless that unit was already within three inches of the enemy unit. So you have to set up your new models that were previously slain in the unit next to models that were there before you started the setup. This prevents people from daisy chaining their uh, returned models out somewhere. This uh, makes everything stay clumped up together. 12.3 wards. Rolls to negate wounds and mortal wounds now are called ward saves. Only one ward can be made per wound or mortal wound allocated. Unless you are Hagnar, then you get a reroll, and that's pretty lame. Battleshock phase. You no longer get plus one to your bravery for every 10 models in the unit during the Battleshock phase. This is really more about what's not in the rules rather than what is in the rules. End of the battle round. The battle round ends. End of battle round effects happen. That's it. It's pretty self-explanatory. Terrain. This is where some things get kind of interesting. So now we are given a definition of what being behind a terrain feature is. If the unit targeting them is more than three inches from that unit, so making a missile attack, all models are within one inch of the terrain feature, and it's impossible for the attacker to draw a slate straight line between the two units without passing across the terrain feature. You are behind that terrain feature. And 17.1.1, a unit behind a terrain feature is in cover, getting plus one to save. 17.1.2, defensible terrain features can be garrisoned. So that is really just uh, another definition that we get here. Uh, up next, another definition item that we get more information on later. Terrain is large if it is 12 to 19 inches across at its widest point, and very large if it is more than 19 inches across at its widest point. And wild woods block line of sight for models with less than 10 wounds, and all forests for some reason are now also wild woods. So we don't have regular forests anymore. All forests are blocking line of sight all the time. More on terrain. So garrisons. Any old terrain feature that can be garrisoned, if it is defensible, you can put up to 15 models into that piece of terrain. Large terrain can get up to 30 models, and very large terrain can get up to 60 models. So your Skaven clan rats or your Grots in a nice big unit of 60 can all jump inside one piece of terrain. And we get this rule for demolishing terrain. So terrain now can be demolished, and we'll see more on that later on. When the terrain is demolished and there are units inside the garrison, you roll a die for each model in the garrison on a one, a model is slain. The surviving models get set up within six inches of the terrain feature and more than three inches away from enemy units. Objectives. So, when contesting objectives, models with more than five wounds now count as two models to contest that objective, and monsters count as five models. Section 19, Wizards. Miscasts are back! I know everyone missed them so much. And now they are no longer on an asinine table, 
If you roll a two to cast, you just take D3 mortal wounds and the wizard cannot attempt to cast any more spells in that turn. We have new arcane bolt and mystic shield. Arcane Bolt has a cast saving value of 5 and a range of 12. After you successfully cast Arcane Bolt at the start of any phase before your next hero phase, any enemy unit in range takes one mortal wound. So you can cast Arcane Bolt, then move within range, and then do the mortal wound. If that unit is within three inches of the wizard, and this is where it gets interesting, so if that wizard moves into range and then charges into combat, that unit takes D3 mortal wounds instead. Mystic Shield has gone back to its 1.0 version, and now on a casting value of five in a range of 12 inches, you get plus one to save once again. No more of the reroll ones to save nonsense. We're just getting plus one now. 19.5. All predatory endless spells are moved at the end of each hero phase. That is a big change. They're moving twice per battle round now. But don't worry, all of the predatory endless spells got new war scrolls, so they are not crazy broken. They are just really good. Predatory Endless Spells are now controlled if they remain within 30 inches of their caster. And Wild Endless Spells, those are endless spells that are not controlled, are no longer within 30 inches of their caster or the caster has been slain. Wild Endless Spells are moved similarly to the old method, the active player gets to move a spell first then the opponent and they alternate until all of the wild endless spells are activated Monsters! Monstrous Rampages! Each of your monsters may perform a monstrous rampage at the end of each charge phase. And it is not limited to the turns they charged. It is every charge phase. Each of these abilities can only be used once per turn, so sprinkle them around on your monsters. The first is Roar on a roll of a three-up a unit within three inches of the monster cannot receive commands in the next combat phase. That's a pretty big deal. Stomp on a two up. An enemy unit within three inches of the monster suffers D3 mortal wounds. Titanic duel. If the monster is within three inches of an enemy monster, it is plus one to hit in the following combat phase. And then smash to rubble. This lets you demolish a garrisonable train, train feature. And if it is a faction scenery piece, all of the rules are removed until the end of the game. 22, War Scrolls. This is just explaining what we already knew. Faction Terrain War Scrolls, more of what we already knew. And the spells and invocation war scrolls, still stuff that we already knew. 25, Pitch Battle Profiles. So all of our unit sizes now are no longer a range. They are a finite number. Unit will come in three or five or 10 or 20 or various other sizes. Now, 
rather than having that range of size that a unit is allowed to be, we have reinforcements. A unit is reinforced by having twice as many as the unit size, and battle line units can be reinforced twice, so they would have three times their minimum unit size. In a 2,000 point game, now this is from the General's Handbook, you have four reinforcements. So you're gonna be limited in the number of additional large units that you're able to take. Points values, also noted from the General's Handbook, there are no more horde discounts for taking large units. We are, between these two rules, are looking at smaller games um, with uh, smaller units. Battalions. So War Scroll Battalions no longer have pitch battle profiles. Uh, that is from the General's Handbook. They're not available for match play. They're replaced with core battalions, which do not cost points. One drop deployment, there's one uh, core battalion that allows you to have one drop. Other core battalions do not have that effect anymore. They also do not automatically give you an additional artifact. They don't give you additional command points automatically. But we'll see in the six core battalions that we have, we have six different abilities that they have. These are available to everyone. Unified drops that whole battalion as a single drop. Expert, uh, once per game, a unit in the battalion can use all-out attack or all-out defense without spending a command point. Magnificent, you can pick an additional enhancement for your army. More on enhancements later. Slayers, once per game, a unit in the battalion can use all-out attack or unleash hell without spending a command point. Strategist, once per game, at the start of your hero phase, you gain an additional command point. And Swift, once per game, a unit in the battalion can use at the double or forward to victory without spending a command point. So very simplified core battalions that we have here. There are also additional core battalions in the General's Handbook. 27 Allegiance Abilities. Enhancements, as we mentioned before, these are a unified term for command traits, artifacts, spell lores, prayer scriptures, mount traits, triumphs, and the rule book basically says etc uh, for anything else that might come up in the future enhancements can't be given to unique units except of course all of those spell lores and prayer scriptures those all got errata so that wizards are allowed to take uh spells from their native spell lore if they are a wizard or prayers if they're a priest and then we got in 27.5 a whole bunch of universal enhancements. Real quick universal command traits, reroll, run, and charge rolls for the hero. At the start of your hero phase, you get a command point on a roll of a five up. You reroll chanting rolls for the general, add one to the wounds characteristic of the general, which, you know, this is in most books already anyway. So just in case you wanted to choose not to give your hero a second wound twice, uh, it's in here. Uh, Master of Magic, reroll casting unbinding and dispelling rolls for a wizard. Universal Artifacts, Amulet of Destiny gives you a 5-up ward save. We're going to be seeing that one all over the place. Vial of Manticore Venom, one weapon is plus one to wound. Arcane Tome, I feel like we're going to see this one a lot as well. The bearer becomes a wizard or can cast an additional spell if they're already a wizard. And Seed of Rebirth, if you roll a heroic recovery roll, you can re-roll it for that hero if you fail. Universal Spell Lore, Flaming Weapon casts on a four, targets the caster, and one of its melee weapons is plus one to damage until your next hero phase. Levitate, 
casting value of 9, range 18, and the target can fly until your next hero phase. Ghost Mist, casting value 5, range 6, you pick a terrain feature in range and visible, and it blocks line of sight until your next hero phase in the same manner that Wild Woods do, so it doesn't affect units with 10 or more wounds. Universal Prayer Scripture, Guidance, answer value 5, receive 1 command point. Heal, answer value 3, pick a unit within 12. And Visible, it heals D3 wounds. And then Curse, this one is quite popular with a lot of list brewers. Answer value 4, range 9, pick an enemy unit in range, and unmodified hit rolls of 6 do mortal wounds in addition to normal damage. 27 allegiance abilities continued there are three universal triumphs now different from prior editions you choose your triumph in your list and uh, you don't have to roll for it as you did in previous iterations of the game what you do now is you get your triumph if you have less points in your army list than your opponent does Bloodthirsty, once per battle, you can reroll a charge. Inspired, once per battle, a unit is plus one to wound until end of phase. Caradron Overlords love that one. Indomitable, once per game, you can ignore a failed battle shock roll. So that is after the battle shock test is taken. And section 28, Battle Packs. This is the name given to sets of rules for playing games. The General's Handbook overall is a battle pack this year, and I'm sure we will get a, be getting more battle packs in the future. But for now, that's the one we've got. And it is in the realm of Gur for this year. It gives us all of our scenarios, realm rules, various other uh, special items as well. We have some core battalions in there that you can use in addition to the ones in the core book. And that's it. That's all the changes. That's all, folks. We got through all of the changes in third edition Age of Sigmar.